when I was really, really young, way back when everything was in sepia, you know those days? <laughs> I remember coming out of the gates at primary school, piling out with all my friends. And as the other kids walked out of the gate, they started sniggering. <laughs> just started giggling at something that they could see somewhere outside the school and I couldn't see it yet what is it what are they laughing at and there outside the school gates and honestly I can feel my heart pounding just thinking about this now outside the school gates there was my mum sitting in the car as she usually did except my mum, my trustworthy, amazing mum, who I looked up to like anything, like a god, my mum. And she was sitting in the car in front of all my peers, wearing a pair of comedy glasses, <laughs> complete with a false nose and bushy eyebrows <laughs> and a moustache. I do not remember ever feeling so mortified in my entire life. Never before in my seven or so years <laughs> had I ever wanted the ground to open up and swallow me whole before. So I ran over to the car, I got in, I slammed the door behind me, and I demanded that she take those off immediately. I was distraught. And do you know what she did? She turned around and she started laughing at me. <laughs> Can you imagine ever doing something so ridiculous? Ever. Now, of course, eventually, I calmed down a little bit. Eventually... Probably by the time we got home, I was beginning to see the funny side. And looking back now, I can remember that my mum was teaching me one of the, if not the, most valuable lesson of my life. My mum and her dad, my granddad, and various other family members were teaching me how to laugh at myself. And it was never in a derogatory way. It was never in that way that you know, we're, we assume that other people are going to belittle us, so we just need to get the punch in there first. It was never about that. Not once was it about that. It was about learning to walk lightly. Now, I was born in 1974. So I grew up through the 70s and the 80s. And of course, we had all of the struggles and the fears and the dramas of any other family growing up at, at that time. But I honestly believe that what got us through was the laughter. There was the time that one of my aunts decided that she'd quite like to try walking on stilts. And so I remember my mum and one of my aunts, out in our back garden, and my grandfather, bless him, had bought me a pair of good old-fashioned wooden stilts. Remember the wooden ones with the stilt blocks that bolted onto the sides? And I remember my aunt lying down on the patio as my mother threaded the stilts up her very tight 80s jeans. <laughs> and then my mum hauled her up, and everything was great until, of course, she then realised that she couldn't bend her knees. <laughs> now, for any of you, who here remembers Wurzel Gummidge in the opening credits? Like, Meow. it was like that. There was the time that my mum and dad took us on a family holiday and we stayed. As anybody else here did the caravanning thing in the 80s, yeah? We did the usual thing, we went caravanning, and the caravan park was attached to a farm. And on the way out, the car wouldn't move. So my mum got out of the car in her best Winsmore coat. We knew that because she told us about every 10 minutes that this was her best Winsmore coat. 
The car got stuck. My mum got out to push the car. And just as my dad depressed the accelerator, the car moved, and my mother went face first into a pile of cow dung, <laughs> which was a lovely, lovely trip back from Somerset to Leicestershire. <laughs> what else happens? All kinds of things. My grandfather, my mum's dad, when he was still work, walking this earth with us, was such a japer. The frequent thing he would do would be to, to go out somewhere in the car, somewhere I was with him, and we'd drive out somewhere in the car in his Austin Maxi, and we'd stop at a phone box. You remember the days when we actually had to stop and get into a phone box to make a call? He'd stop at a phone box and he'd call home and he'd speak to my mum or one of my aunts, whichever family member was visiting. Mum was one of eight, so it's quite a big family. And he'd tell them that, the car had broken down, he'd run out of fuel. And then we'd time, it would sit at the side of the road and we'd be driving past waving as they came to rescue him. He did things like that frequently. He sent my mum and my aunt off onto um, a bit of a wild goose chase one day. He sent them out to pick something up. I forget what it was. Well, let's say it was fence panels or a shed, which would have been typical for my grandfather. And they turned up at the address to pick up the, the fence panels, only to be told that there was no fence panel and nobody had heard of anything for sale. That was typical. So my household, whatever was going on, there were always laughs. From exploding cigarettes, to wellies stuck in mud, to my family playing Scrabble and eating each other's pieces of paper with the scores on so they couldn't prove who'd won. Things like that were really, really commonplace. We used to have that kind of laughter in our family where you couldn't breathe. We used to talk about our family as having laughing fits, kind of tears streaming down your face kind of laughter. There's an old family story where one of my aunts was having one of these laughing fits once and my dad picked up an ashtray and tipped it into her mouth, which I think he thought was funny at the time. But stuff like that happened all the time. And I honestly believe that it was that those formative teachings taught me to be able to walk lightly now. So let's have a little look at who we're talking about. So that's my dad. That's me with my mum and a couple of my aunts. I'm not going to tell you which one of those had the stilts up the legs, but it is one of them. And as you can see there, that was about 2006 when I was still in corporate. And my hair is naturally pink. But I had to bleach it then to, to be acceptable to, to the corporate world. And then that's my grandfather. As you can see, he taught me to be shy and retiring from a young age too. And the gold lame shirt in the middle was kind of typical for, you know, Sunday afternoon. <laughs> so anyway, back to the, the, the title of this talk, The Science of Being Silly. Actually, if I'm going to start talking science. I'm just going to put my reading glasses on because these are my driving glasses. <laughs> so, <laughs> my goodness, that makes your nose sweaty. <laughs> it's going to glint beautifully under these lights. So the title of this talk is The Science of Being Silly, but I want to make it absolutely clear that some of the areas I'm going to go into, although I'm going to touch on science a little bit, aren't technically science and silly, related. There's some stuff about being playful and whimsical. But, you know, the science of being silly, you know, it scans nicely, and we need to remember, you know, the, the allure of alliteration. So, I want to just touch on a time where I wasn't so happy. What happened was once I got through school, once I started to go into adulthood, and started to be more in charge of my own life, I kind of forgot about the silliness. I hit some massive lows. You know, I was flying high, top of corporate career, but going through some real nasty stuff in my life. I went through abusive relationships and all kinds of stuff, and ultimately that culminated in a breakdown and depression and anxiety and some of the labels that so many of us have had. And I can look back now and know that one of the things that got me out of that mindset was being able to be silly. You know, when I started to retrain in, in coaching and personal development, and I learned that being silly could be used to break state, 
that wonderful thing that the professionals tell us is a way of getting out of one mindset and into another. So if we think of Tony Robbins, probably one of the greatest coaches and experts on the human condition of our time, he breaks states sometimes by saying, I'm really happy today because my feet don't smell. It's really silly, you know, isn't it? I do things every day to help me break states that are silly. I mean, who in their right mind would buy a brand new pair of jeans and graffiti all over them? <laughs> there are things on these jeans that make me happy. There's positive phrases. I, I officially have positive jeans now, <laughs> ladies and gentle people. But even though I'd got, that, got out of that space and I'd started to rebuild and I was finding my happiness again, the one thing I recognised is that not all my peers got this whole idea of being silly. So I'd now got to a point where I could happily go into the supermarket and do some sort of silly dance down the aisles. But bless, my, my, my lovely wife would, would hide from me and try to tell me to stop. She'd be hiding behind the mushy peas or something and I'd be japing around the corner. And I remember going to Brighton Pier one, one day with, with my missus and her, and her best friend. And as I was happily doing a one-woman jive down the pier, they were hiding around the corner and refusing to come out until I started just behaving like a grown-up, for goodness sake. <laughs> but all of this made me start to think, I wonder if there's actually something in this whole silliness as a healing vibe. Can we use it in some way? You know, when we look at silliness being used to break state, I wondered... Is that what my family were doing for all those years? Were they actually, unwittingly, breaking their state? Is that how we used to have so much crying, belly laughing, massive giggles? Is that why? Were we breaking state? So I, I did what any sane person would do in this year, and I hit Google. <laughs> and I literally Googled the science of being silly. And this guy popped up, Professor René Proyer. <laughs> Professor Proyer is at Martin Luther University. And he's somewhat of a specialist in adult and adolescent playfulness. To the extent that he and his colleagues have been researching a brand new behaviour model based on playfulness in adults. And it's not silliness per se, but it does bring in things like whimsy. And he was telling me that the research has shown so far that actually being able to get into that playful, silly, whimsical zone as an adult can have all kinds of beneficial effects. It can positively affect everything from relationships through to career progression. And we mustn't get this mixed up with being laughed at. When we laugh at ourselves, it's not about um, it's, it's not about laughing at ourselves in a derogatory way, as I said earlier. And he was telling me that there are a lot of people in the world who have a very real phobia of being laughed at. So we need to make that distinction. But then I started to dig in a little bit more deeply. You know, he's saying that we should all, as adults, find more time for being playful in our lives. So I'd like to challenge you to all do that. When you go home tonight, do something silly. Graffiti your jeans. Got a fake nose and wear it to bed with your partner and see what happens. <laughs> what do you mean he's already wearing one? That's not very nice. <laughs> anyway, I dug a bit deeper and I, I started to look at some other elements. Oh, that's my wife, by the way. She's now got to the point where if you can't beat them, join them. She's sometimes sillier than me. Anyway, I started to research a bit more. And I found other things that I could connect back to being a bit silly, to being a bit frivolous, or actually to just having fun with your life. Now, some of you might recognise this baby as a chromosome. And to be clear, I am not a scientist in any way. I'm a coach, I'm a speaker, I'm an author, I'm not a scientist. I scored an F in chemistry, which obviously stood for fabulous, <laughs> of course. Anyway, so this, is, this baby is a chromosome, and the kind of squiggly bit in the middle is DNA. And those jazzy little yellow caps on the end are called telomeres. Now, the telomeres are kind of like the hard hats of chromosomes. They are protective caps that keep everything safe. 
And as luck would have it, just as I was about to do this talk, BBC Science Focus magazine came out and gave me loads of stats, which meant I could put down the big, thick books on telomeres I was reading, which are fascinating. Do go and get them. And there's some amazing research being done that has found that people who tend to be more cynical or pessimistic than those of us who are more optimistic have thinner telomeres on their DNA. Now, what's that got to do with anything? Well, because they are protective, thin telomeres have been linked to everything from heart conditions to lung disease. And it doesn't just stop there. They have found, through research, that if we find ways to increase our telomerase, I'm hoping I've pronounced that right, which is the enzyme that kind of helps the telomeres to stay thicker, we can start to rebuild them. So there is hope for all those people that we have seen as mood hoovers or, you know, neg heads. You can actually do it. There's a study where they sent people off to a meditation retreat. And when they came back, their telomerase had gone up by something like 30%. So this stuff is really worth investigating. Through being playful and happy in our bodies, we really can make ourselves healthier. And they've been linked to all kinds of things like youthful appearance as well, all kinds of stuff. Go and have a look, honestly. And then there's this other study I really love. In the 1980s, some psychologists started analysing the journals of a bunch of nuns, 180 nuns between the ages of 20 and 30. And they found that the nuns whose journal entries seemed to be more optimistic than the others lived, on average, seven to ten years longer than those who were more negative. I want to end on one quick point, and this is where I'm going to need some audience participation. This is scientifically proven to boost your mood. I want you to take your arms, cross them over, and grab an earlobe in each hand. And then, without breaking contact, I want you to move your thumbs across so that you're touching your nose at the same time. And then I want you to carefully move them back and grab your ears without breaking contact. And then I want you to turn and look at the person next to you and see how you feel now. <laughs> You've just been silly and you feel better, don't you? That is the science of being silly. Thank you very much. <laughs>